everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number, I think it's going to be 130. Now, I'm going to be honest, uh, this is the first show um, in the whole of all 130 episodes we've done now that I'm actually a little bit nervous. Now, the reason why I'm a little bit nervous is because uh, there's one man that inspired my sort of initial journey in the fitness industry, and I have this man on the podcast today. Now, I've talked about his book a lot in the past, How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy. I've talked about his theories, I've talked about his work, um, and I've told you how I kind of done his courses in the early days and stuff, and I've finally pinned him down, and he's on the show, and he's going to share some what I think will be incredible opinions today. Uh, Mr. Paul Check, hello. Hello, thank you. Um, you uh, are a man that's in, kind of inspired my work an awful amount um, throughout the years, now, I'm hoping that a lot of people on this podcast know who you are, because I've, I've talked about your book an awful lot. Um, for people that don't know who you are, who is Paul Check? <laughs> well, that's a very deep question. I would say I'm first and foremost a soul with a passion for life. And second of all, professionally speaking, I'm a holistic health practitioner. Uh huh. And... Uh, those are sort of the two boxes I would put myself into. One's less of a box and the other one's more of a box, but that's who I am. Um, I think when people ask me this question, like, Ben, what do you do? I find it more and more difficult as I age because your your work becomes more multifactorial. You start to do more and more things, you know, more management-based stuff, etc. I'd be interested, you know, you, you've come from a di various different backgrounds. You've gone through various different processes. Where are you at right now with your work? Well, you know, there's a, a number of factors involved there. Um, the best way to synthesize that is that um, I'm working to further fuse holistic principles into what was previously the Czech practitioner program. So it's not so musculoskeletal oriented. Um, my initial intention was to do that, but, uh, you know, back in the, oh, see, I think I started my Czech practitioner program in 95. And at that time, my wife did not feel that, uh, putting the holistic elements into the Czech practitioner program would be good for business because the, concepts were considered too airy fairy and, and odd for people at that time and actually when I originally named the Institute it was the corrective holistic exercise kinesiology Institute mm -hmm. and uh, business experts told me not to use the name because it, that title would uh, categorize me as something that was too uh, far out in the woods for most people to associate with and now of course you know, years ago, my wife came back to me and said, okay, now the market's changed. We need to change the name back again. And, you know, my point being is that all the way back, the first level four students I ever trained were, were taught in many of these holistic concepts and all the level four students are such as visceral reflexes and mental emotional con connections and orientation around the chakra system. Um, but that was only the most advanced practitioners that were getting that information simply because I'm sure you're aware enough with my information enough that it is fairly complex for most people to learn mm -hmm. and um, due to the lack of anatomy and physiology uh, and psychology and many other sciences in most of the uh, exercise professionals and even professional medical rehabilitation people because as you know my program is multidisciplinary so I have everybody in there from medical doctors to uh, to uh, osteopaths and naturopaths and chiropractors and nurses and athletic trainers and personal trainers and strength coaches and massage therapists and dance and movement educators and the list just goes on. Um, my challenge was that I developed most of my work in a very intensive professional rehabilitation setting in a large physical therapy, the largest physical therapy clinic in San Diego with a surgical center in the center with 13 orthopedic and neurosurgeons and 22 physical therapists combined in one center. So the concepts that I introduced there were um, so radical for them 
that they uh, had a backlash reaction with the exception of the lady that owned the clinic because I rehabilitated her when nobody else could figure out what she what to do with her after she'd had four knee surgeries. And it was so shocking to her surgeon when I was able to do with her and her therapist that they asked me to come work for them. So it was a bit of a paradox because they had evidence that what I was doing worked really well in a situation where they had to throw the towel in and say, I don't know what to do anymore. But then as they got exposed to my approach, it was so contradictory to everything they'd learned in medical school and physical therapy school that <laughs> the inviting family became uh, like the jaws of, of uh, death in, in many ways. I, I was constantly meeting resistance, constantly getting told what I was doing was wrong. And then I had to remind them, well, if it's wrong, then why is it I was able to rehab that last client you sent me in six visits and she'd seen you for 63 visits and got nowhere. Hmm. And so, you know, they could not deny that I was able to get very, very good results very quickly with most of the people they couldn't even begin to do anything with. But the good news is, is that one person there in particular, there was a few, but one who was the senior physical therapist, she was very willing to learn from me, but she shared with me that the reason I was meeting all the resistance was because they speak a language of objectivity. They want to know weights, pressures, measures, ranges of motion, speeds of motion. So when I was a young man, I was working more by observation, and paying attention to things that I could measure, such as how fast a person could run, how much weight they could lift, uh, how their posture was, uh, basic dietary indicators. But they needed something that more was in their language. So as an example, they got me together and said, you know, the exercises you use, as far as we were taught in school, are extremely dangerous, like having people squat with back injuries to, you know, my primal patterns, right? Mm -hmm. So she said, we would like you to put a presentation together for us, for the whole staff, to explain the rationale that you use to select the exercises and the therapeutic approach that you do. So I then did a lot of research and followed through with my theories on developmental man and put together a very comprehensive expose of how it is that I choose these patterns. And that was what forced me to put the primal pattern system into plain language and into print. And I also studied goniometry, which is uh, objective measurement of joints. And I began taking very careful measurements of every movement of every joint a person came to me with a problem with. And I found that I needed more calibrated instrumentation. So I developed the forward head carriage caliper. I developed the first rib inclinometer. And I began tracking patients. So if someone would send me a patient, say from the clinic or a doctor, I would record everything with an initial evaluation so I could show very clearly in their own language, this is what this person looks like when they came to me. This is what they look like after four weeks on my program, six weeks, whatever. And I was able to actually shock the hell out of them by showing them that almost everything they were using in the clinic was actually making people worse. And once I could speak their own language, they could not deny it. So it kind of started a bit of a revolution. So having been through all that, when I develop the Czech practitioner program, I'm now trying to teach the same level of stuff, not to physical therapists with master's degrees and orthopedic surgeons, but now I've got a whole bunch of personal trainers and people with almost no legitimate training. So my system got really slowed down. In other words, I wanted to teach what I knew, but I couldn't because it was so over the heads of people that actually just, you know, stressed them out and, and uh, caused academic stress on them because, for example, they couldn't understand how an organ like the adrenal glands could shut down a person's lumbar extensors and lead to spinal instability or disc injury because the, as far as they were concerned, organs lived in another zip code and somebody else dealt with that and that was not even related to the musculoskeletal system. So 
I had to sort of sit on uh, a lot of the information that I teach today for a long time just to get enough people up to a level where they actually had the level of awareness to comprehend what I was teaching. So as time moved by and I developed a larger student base, then I began implementing more and more of that information, which then ultimately I put into the book How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy as a basic structural guideline to share with the public and professionals. Um, you know, there's many doctors and therapists that tell me to this very day that they use that book like a operator's manual in their clinical practice. And uh, in fact, if you look on the back of the book, the guy that wrote the comment, this will be the nutrition Bible of the future by Eric Serrano, MD. He was the physician for the U.S. Powerlifting Federation for many, many years and is an expert on anabolic steroids and athletes come to him from all over the world. And he's the guy that wrote that. So, you, you know, you, you start, I started having people at that level finally recognizing what the hell I was actually saying and realizing that I was telling them the truth. So it went from being a case where everybody was battling me and telling me I was wrong, even though I could prove I was right, to them finally realizing I was telling them the truth. So now where I'm at is finishing that integration process. And I've rebuilt a number of my programs like Exercise Coach, the HLC programs continually been rebuilt and I'm still working on that. And weaving those two systems together and now that we've started the uh, Czech Academy which which was a trial run for a couple of years in England actually now the whole system's moving towards an academy structure where you go through all the Czech training and HLC training as part of one system because you cannot do the work effectively only with Czech practitioner training there's just far too much that will get missed and I'm still on a regular basis consulting Czech practitioners and their clients who have not done HLC training because they're not able to get people all the way to a resolution with just practitioner Czech practitioner training. So that's really the main thrust of what I'm doing and, and where I'm trying to get with everything. So you mentioned how your work's evolved a little bit, especially through the physical and the pain side of things. I saw uh, quite a prominent transition in your work where you laid a foundation for yourself of how you saw the body, how it should move, um, and how we should be teaching that. And then it's almost like once you'd laid that foundation, you went on a personal journey of more about the mindset around all this stuff and your inner self. Uh, and, and you started to see strands of this work, especially coming through the HLC um, 2, uh, no, sorry, HLC 1 program. When did that transition happen and why? Why did you see people needing this information? Yeah, that's a good question and I'll give you a good answer. <laughs> you know, when I, I came to San Diego in October 1986 when I left the United States Army as the trainer of the Army boxing team. The Army boxing team at the time was the third best boxing team in the world and you may not know this, but in the 1988 Olympics, of all 12 boxers that had to fight their way on to the U.S. Olympic boxing team, 11 of them came from my team. Most people don't know that. 11 out of 12 of the best boxers our country can put in front of television came from one boxing team, and I trained that boxing team. So I have a lot of experience with things like why people don't do the things they need to do. Amongst those fighters, there were many great fighters that absolutely were lazy and didn't want to train because they had great fighting skills and that had carried them so far. But once you get to international competition and you're facing a Russian or a Cuban, you cannot make those mistakes because Russians and Cubans do not have any problem with their work ethic and they don't eat junk food. So I began noticing that the athletes that started having problems as they approached higher and higher levels of elite competition were the athletes that had problems in their own life. In other words, unresolved challenges with their father or uh, grief that they hadn't overcome, or they were doing their boxing as a means not of achieving their potential as a boxer, but as a second option to avoid their military duties because they just didn't like being in the army. And that kind of a scapegoat 
approach isn't enough to motivate you through the trials of being a world-class athlete. So they had enough skill to be on the team, but there was always some kind of underlying um, detractor factor that would stop them from uh, fulfilling their mission and doing the work that the, the truly inspired fighters would do. Then when I left and, and came to San Diego, you know, the place was just flooded. San Diego is a Mecca for every kind of therapist. There's, you know, f there, at that time there was five massage therapy schools in San Diego and, and there's like four rows in the San Diego newspaper of people that'll do massage for like 15 or 20 bucks an hour because there's just so many of them. And I got my license as a sports massage therapist, so I had a way of practicing legally, charging money, and then could interface with doctors and at least have some kind of a qualification, which I then followed up with and got my holistic health practitioner's license, which took me a thousand hours of accredited training to get, so it was a fair bit more work there. To make a living in San Diego, I went to doctors and therapists all over town, knocked on their door, and offered them to send me the toughest cases that they had that nobody else could get results with. That's how I built my business. And I got extremely good results doing that, but the thing that kept coming up over and over again is I was getting these very tough cases with everything under the sun wrong with them, and oftentimes two medical files, you know, two inches thick, full of tests, reports, scans, everything, and nobody could figure out what was wrong with these people. And I noticed that there was a pattern, that there was an underlying problem in their life that they were not able to resolve. Either they were in marriages and they didn't want to be in them, or they were in a crisis, a spiritual crisis, where they were maybe a, a real common theme is they were Christians, but they didn't feel any sense of spiritual connection or depth, or they felt like they couldn't live the life they want to live because God was judging them all the time, and they were sinning, and or you get someone, for example, that's in a married relationship and they think they're supposed to be with that person till death do they part, but they're having sex on the side. And the crisis that it creates inside of them because of all the guilt and shame manifests as problems. It manifests as neck pain, headaches, temporomandibular joint pain, structural dysfunction, digestive elimination, and the list just goes on. So as I worked with these patients, the theme kept popping up over and over again that the body that wasn't responding to some of the best therapists in the world was not responding because they were treating the symptom of the problem. They weren't actually addressing the problem. Fortunately for me, when I was 15, my mother sent me away to summer camp to work with self, the Self-Realization Fellowship monks, Paramahansa Yogananda's monks. So I was able to spend time with some very evolved people learning meditation techniques and learning methods that I could then use to connect to people. And through my training and being around my mother and learning some of these things and some of the childhood experiences, mystical experiences I had as a child, um, I was able to be so present with people and my life has been quite challenging and, and um, I've been exposed to a lot of things. So Needless to say, I don't have a lot of judgment. You know, I did a lot of this challenging work with Christianity and all the pain it caused and got into yoga. And, and, and my mother, you know, became a yogi at age when I was 12. So I had a lot of chance to sort of correlate my mother's Christian upbringing and influence with the approach that Yogananda gives as an Eastern approach to yoga. And I could see that that was such a software upgrade. It was so much more liberating and freeing, and, and I could get answers from the monks on my questions that I could not get from anybody in a church. And it brought me to a place where I could see that there was nothing wrong, and that what we call God is not a judging God. God is unconditional love, and that because of that, I was able to hold an empty space in myself where people could explain things to me and express things about their whatever it be, their, their wife challenges, their anger at their parents or, or their, you know, someone that ripped them off financially. Like I've had a lot of famous athletes who have been ripped off by their managers and had millions of dollars taken. And then it screws them up inside because they're so angry that they can never balance themselves. And they just go into a progressive state of chronic fatigue, which everyone keeps thinking is coming from their training, but it's because they have unresolved anger inside of them. 
So I, I got patients that were so complicated, even with all my knowledge, there was no way to figure out what was wrong because there was like 25 major things happening at the same time. Everything was screwed up. Their hormonal system was screwed up. Their digestion elimination was screwed up. Their body was full of pain. There was inflammation everywhere. They had symptoms sometimes of two or three different diseases and disorders overlapping at the same time. They were taking piles of medical drugs with very complex symptom profiles that were also complicating the actual symptoms that they had. So I would go into a meditative state and I would just open myself and ask my soul or God to, to give me any messages that they could give me. And what kept rising up was I would have visions of someone having like sexual tension because maybe their wife had lost her sex drive after having a couple of kids and now the husband was still normal and wanting sex but it was causing so much tension in the relationship that they didn't know how to resolve it and it was producing all sorts of mental emotional pains and problems. Well after I did, you know, you do this for a number of years and all of a sudden you start to see a very, very clear pattern. That what people are coming to therapists for at large are the symptoms of unresolved mental, emotional and spiritual challenges in their life and the body is mirroring their mind. You take that and you put the knowledge of the chakra system on top of that which gives you a matrix by which you can begin reading these problems and asking questions. And I found once I started applying the first the, the Taoist system, then the chakra system, the seven chakra system made it so much easier for me to just ask the right questions and I could get to the hot buttons in seconds. So I began cross-referring with a psychologist and many other practitioners that had unique skills. And I was able to help a huge percentage of these people work through their problems, but I spent most of my time dealing with what I would call the challenges of life. And once I helped those people through the challenges of life, it was like somebody waved a magic wand, their bodies just started to heal. Uh, coupled with that was the nutritional element. You know, I studied, uh, you know, medical nutrition with Jeffrey Bland and Metagenics and all the complex systems of nutrition and biochemistry and devoted myself to that study and practice for three years and saw almost no difference in my patients whatsoever. So I, I was quite dismayed with it all. And then by happen chance, I read, uh, well, I, got, I bought a product that came with a questionnaire, which was to identify your metabolic type. And I thought that this was very interesting because at that time I was studying sports nutrition, which was all very heavily carbohydrate based and it was screwing me up. I was bloated all the time. I was gassy. And paradoxically, I was eating way more carbohydrate than I ever did because I was raised on a farm. So we ate mostly our own animals and vegetables. So I ate kind of a caveman diet from my childhood. So when I took this metabolic typing test, I turned out to be a protein type that said I should be eating about 60 to 70 percent animal flesh. So about two portions of meat to one portion of vegetables. So I thought, well, shit, I'm going to give it a try. That's basically how I ate growing up. I'll tell you what, within 72 hours of me switching to that diet, my gut gas went away, my muscle definition improved, my muscle started to recover much faster, my head was clear, and it shocked me to such a degree, I started running that test on every one of my patients. And it was so profound when I started using that dietary advice and adjusting their diet and then teaching them how to fine tune their diet. I saw revolutionary changes. I saw people in two weeks heal more than they healed in 10 years just by getting good quality food in the right proportion for their body's needs. So then I realized I had to do a better job of making sure that anybody coming to me with structural problems or health problems of any kind knew how to eat and drink or you could never get them better because they just didn't have the resources to do it. And there was so much pro-inflammatory um, chemicals coming into their diet, things like too much um, omega-6 fatty acids, processed foods, trans fatty acids, all that stuff was just poisoning their body and triggering inflammatory reactions. So those, those were like the initial steps. That, that by the way, that 
I wanted to use that questionnaire with all my patients, but I wanted to get permission legally to do that. So I contacted the company and they said, we can't give you permission because we didn't write that. We hired a guy named Bill Walcott. I said, how do I get a hold of him? So they put me in touch with Bill Walcott, who you probably know, wrote the metabolic typing guy and is kind of the world's leader in metabolic typing. So Bill gave me permission to use that. And that developed my relationship with Bill, which ultimately led me to going to his system to get metabolic type training, which further enhanced my knowledge and my ability to teach this. So as I built all this up, every all the pieces started coming together, and I just started to see that, well, to be honest with you, the whole medical system and exercise system was so far off the mark because they were all making the same mistakes that... Uh, it just inspired me to continue my work and essentially why the HLC program is the way it is and why my program is the way it is is because first of all you got to realize research shows that about 85 percent of all orthopedic injuries reported to medical doctors physical therapists and all those people that treat them are idiopathic which means the patient does not know how they got the injury which means it's a chronic injury that came on over time as opposed to an acute injury where they hurt themselves skiing or got tackled in rugby and got hurt. So when you consider that 85 out of every 100 injuries going to these people is idiopathic, and when you understand how the body works, you're actually seeing the musculoskeletal system mirror to you the imbalance of the inner self. Then if you study the anatomy and physiology of the organs and glands, they clearly have a precedence in the survival reflex systems of the nervous system over the musculoskeletal system, which means if there's any pathology in a gland or an organ, it will reserve blood flow and nutrition and waste removal for the organ and shut the musculoskeletal system down to protect itself. So once I started analyzing visceral systems, which I later developed a much more comprehensive system too, I found that Nine times out of ten, the musculoskeletal problems were only symptoms of internal disorders. So each step I made, my therapy got more comprehensive, I got faster results, and I was able to get my finger right on the hot button quickly. And it grew to the point that today, I've come to realize that the most important thing that you can do with anyone is find out what is their dream. What is it that they want to do but think they can't do? What is it they're willing to change for? What would they love to do more than what they're doing right now that's causing them the pain? Once I started orientating all of my language about, you know, say, for example, if a golfer comes to me with back pain and I say, what's your dream? He says, I just want to hit the ball 20 yards further. Then I, everything I told him, whether it be to change his diet, whether it be to go get a colonic and get his colon cleaned out, I always clearly explain how these seemingly weird things would actually improve hitting that golf ball further, playing with their kids, lifting heavier weights, running faster, jumping higher. And I have enough knowledge that I can explain complicated concepts to people. And what I started doing was hiring an artist and I would hand draw diagrams so I could clearly explain these connections so that anybody could understand them. So after doing this, for, you know, from 90, well, I started this work in January 1984. So by about 96 or 97, or maybe 97, 98, I had had, I developed a whole series of what I called patient handouts that covered everything. And then it just dawned on me one day, you know, why do I have to wait until people are sick to tell them the things that almost everyone on this planet is doing wrong? Why don't I just put all these handouts into a book and give it to the world for 25 bucks so they don't have to flounder around and spend thousands and thousands of dollars on unnecessary surgeries and doctor visits and therapist visits, etc. And that is what Eat, Move, and Be Healthy is. It is a collection of the handouts that I had to use with almost every patient in order to get them balanced and healthy. And I just wrapped a book around it to try to explain why you need to do it that way. And what a fine book it is. Um, you, the book has, we talked about metabolic typing, the book has sort of the simplified metabolic typing methodology in it. Now, yeah. in your personal practice and how you like to deliver 
even simple dietary make makeups for people. Do you do you still use the advanced metabolic typing questionnaire, or do you try and apply the simple methods? Because I I personally gravitated away from the advanced methods a long time ago, purely because I can't I couldn't get enough people to understand the complexity of it, and I also thought it kind of overcomplicated a lot of things because no one's really ready for that. Well. There's a that's it's a good comment and I will share my own observation and and you know I I know Bill Walcott really well and I'm a consultant to numerous metabolic typing advisors all over the world when they can't get their clients better and what I found consistently is that the reason people with any level of metabolic typing all the way to the most advanced level are running into trouble is because they keep thinking that the metabolic typing response to your testing or questionnaires is a prescription that you are supposed to follow like the Ten Commandments in the Bible. And the human body is radically more dynamic than that. So I started running tests on myself. So for quite some time I did salivary pH tests and urinary pH tests to see how the pHs of my body were responding to things like if I ate a pile of meat and then monitored that consistently over time and how did that differ from the different workouts I was doing so with every workout I would test before and after and what I found out is I could produce a greater pH shift by far in one workout doing heavy squats or deadlifts that would last for sometimes two days push me down to like 5.5 or 5.6 in the acid range but I could eat as much meat as I wanted to and it might drop me down from say 7 to 6.8 so of course I was studying all the diet stuff and all the you know Gabriel Cousins and all these people touting all this anti-meat diet and I found out that <laughs> what they were overlooking is that there's many other things that people are doing that are making a much much more acid for example if you're drinking water out of a reverse osmosis filtration system it's almost always acidic so you can be making your whole biochemistry go crazy drinking what you thought was good water which isn't good water because it's too acidic mm -hmm. so what I found through all this testing is that and I want to preface this by saying I've talked to Bill Walcott about this extensively and he actually teaches what I've resorted to but his practitioners just didn't have the capacity to really grasp and I know full well that a lot of students don't do what the teacher says they do what they want to do mm -hmm. and they don't want to do the work that it takes to really teach metabolic typing correctly so what I found out is that the metabolic typing prescription is only a starting point from which a person must begin an honest exploration of their response to what they're eating and drinking and the fine-tuning element of it is where the real meat and potatoes is so really all it is metabolic typing ultimately is a system by which you become aware of what your body's needs are but our culture is so trapped in their head and so dis disconnected from their bodies that they would just keep following the metabolic type prescription and not paying attention when it says things like did you have good energy for four hours after a meal and even though they would write no they would keep eating the same way do you have mental clarity? No. Are you pooping normally? All these types of questions. Well, even though they would keep writing no, they would keep following the diet exactly like it was written down instead of looking at the fine-tuning chart. So in my book, you know, you saw I have a fine-tuning chart that says yeah. if you have these symptoms, eat less of this and more of that as a basic guideline. So over time, I found that anything that stops a person from paying attention to what their body is telling them and causes them to follow a diet is no different than any other diet book or prescription and it leads to all sorts of metabolic challenges and I found that within my own body I could do a heavy deadlift session and need piles of meat but then on the days that I wasn't training like a rest day my body wanted to eat like a carbo type sometimes even vegetarian I even went into one year of vegetarianism using these methods and listening to what my body wanted and it guided me into an entire year without meat and I lost a lot of weight and it was very challenging for me psychologically but it was what my body was telling me I needed which means I probably needed a very heavy detoxification period 
So the primal pattern dieting system that I developed uses the basic metabolic typing questionnaire because ultimately all you need to know is where, with key indicators, where does a person start? Yeah. My whole system has evolved now where it's, I teach the HLC practitioners many techniques for learning how to listen to and read the signs and symptoms that their body is giving them. What does it mean and what do you change in your diet as a intelligent response to those systems symptoms and after years of doing this now i have piles of evidence that someone can be a protein type at breakfast a mixed type at lunch a carbo type at dinner and every variation in between any time and the one thing that's always the deciding factor is how much stress they're under and that doesn't mean mental stress only it means physical stress emotional stress mental stress, electromagnetic stress, thermal stress, all the key types of stressors because they summate in the body and they create a stress picture. So if a person does not learn to have a relationship with their body and listen to their body with great reverence, then they will keep following a prescription that's based on tests. And you got to remember that any of these types of tests, even lab tests, are a snapshot of that moment. They do not tell you what caused that or where it's going. They don't tell you if you're on your way towards balance or away from balance. They only take a picture. So if, if, if I took a picture of you right now and put it all over the world and says, this is who this guy is, they would all think you had some kind of a birthmark under your left eye and that's who you are. And then you'd walk right past them in a shopping mall and they wouldn't recognize you without your black eye. That's what the problem is with a lot of these tests are. So as a therapist, I found out the test only tells me what's happening right now, but I have to look carefully at their personal life, their professional life, their spiritual life, where they feel stuck, what's challenging, what are they angry about, what's unresolved, what are their goals and dreams, and what did I find out? 98% of people have no goals and dreams. All they're doing is living out their parents' directives and their church's directives, working their asses off, trying to make money trying to keep up with the Joneses, but on the inside, they're dead because they're doing nothing for themselves. So the world just becomes a flat land. It doesn't matter how many cars, flat screen televisions or houses they have, nothing changes except the amount of bills they have go up. So at the end of the day, it all boils down to we must take responsibility for having a legitimate, loving, compassionate empathetic relationship with ourselves, and get clear on what it is that we want to create and how we want to contribute to the rest of the world while we're here or pain shows up as a means of in creating as a means of creating conscious awareness as to where you're negating the feedback from your own body mind and spirit that is what i teach that's what i do and that's why people come to me from all over the world and i get Fantastic results where most people fail because I am willing to look into the parts of a person's life most doctors and therapists will not look into for one simple reason. The first thing that they think is if I ask the patient about their sex life or about their financial life or about any of these things, I run the risk that they're going to ask me, well, how is yours, doctor? I also train my therapist to such a degree that if the Therapist is using the system that I used on their clients. The client learns enough to look at the therapist and say, well, it looks like you're not doing this either because you're overweight, because your skin's bad, and you're eating garbage. So the problem with my system is, is if you're not willing to practice it and be a living example of it, it mirrors back at you, and your patients are often intelligent enough to look at you and say, well, why should I do this if you don't do it? Mm -hmm. So check practitioners today are very well informed by me and the instructors, and my instructors must live the principles or I'll let them go, and I've let several of them go. If you show up and I start getting feedback that says you don't look like you're a Czech practitioner or you don't look like a Czech instructor or you don't look like you're following the principles, they get put on warning and they have to come into line with the system or they can't teach. I won't let anyone teach a system they're not practicing and living because then it becomes academic silliness and that's what's got the whole world into a state of disease. We're the smartest, sickest people we've ever been. I completely agree. Now, I, I want to kind of soundbite something. Um, the core message that you just elaborated there on is that a huge amount of people don't have a goal or a dream that they 
can focus on that allows everything else to become positive as a result of that. Now, there's going to be a certain amount of people that listen to everything that you just said and they, they can take it in, it resonates and they can kind of dissect it for themselves. The people that are, we'll say, we'll, we'll say it's more complicated for them. What's the one bit of advice that you would give to someone that doesn't know how to break down what you just said to go away and say, right, do this one thing and it's going to enable you to just maybe open yourself up for this kind of journey? Well, my system uses a four-step format in general. One, what is it I love more than my nightmare? Jerry West says, if you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. So one, what do I love enough to change for? Nobody will do the work to get rid of the body weight, change their diet, clean the shit out of their cupboards, do their stretching, their mobilizations, and the things that anyone needs to do to get their body to work right, unless they have something more exciting going on than their cookies, their cigarettes, their alcohol, and their late night television. So step one is always get clear on what it is that you want to create out of yourself in your lifetime, or you won't have the motivation to do the work you got to do to balance yourself. Once you know what that is, and if, as I often say, if you don't know what your dream is, then identify your nightmare, the key stressor in your life. If you just got rid of this one thing, your, your life would be a lot better because you'd have more energy, more vitality, and be less entangled. And that, unfortunately, often turns out to be something challenging. Like, I'm married, I've got three kids, but I'm not in love, and I haven't been in love with my husband for eight years or ten years, and I could go to counseling, but beyond, to be honest with you, I really don't want to be in this marriage anymore. I want to be out, but I'm too afraid. I don't have the money to be a single mother. I don't have the confidence in myself. Or I'm working at this job that I hate, but I make 150000 bucks a year, and I don't know what else to do with myself. So whenever people work for money, they go into a crisis of self because it never actually provides the nutrition for the soul to feel like it's really growing, learning, and thriving. It's just surviving. So once you know what it is that you want to do or you know what your nightmare is, then you have to look and see where am I out of balance. That's what the question is and how to eat, move, and be healthier for. That's what my four doctors ebook helps guide you through is those four steps. Then when you know where you're out of balance, then you have to make choices. There's only three choices you can make. The optimal, which is the one that's best to get you to your dream most efficiently and best for all the people involved in supporting you. The suboptimal, which is doing what you want to do and getting instant gratification, which is likely to produce pain, which is still a good choice because you have instant feedback about how your choices work. I keep drinking the soda pop or the coffee at night, and I keep having headaches, and I keep having back pain. I didn't listen to... My coach, I didn't listen to what Paul Check said in the book. I did exactly what I wanted to do, and I have evidence that I'm creating my problem. So once you are clear about what you want to do and you know where you're out of balance, then you have to choose either the optimal choice, the suboptimal choice, or you can choose to do nothing. And that represents apathy, which is, is the opposite, really, of love. Uh, apathy means I don't care. And a person that reaches a state of apathy needs professional psychological help or someone with my kinds of skills to work with them because they're just so far down the hole they have no motivation and no hope left and the world's full of them why do you think all these uh, drugs are being used for all these depressions and anxieties these are all people caught in the matrix of meaningless money oriented corporate driven life without any really sense of connection to their spirit you know they don't have an artistic expression. They don't dance. They don't sing. They don't play. It's all about the next car, the next house, or getting your kids into a prestigious school. Meanwhile, you're teaching your kids to live like a rat on a treadmill. So you have three choices. The optimal, which is the best for everyone involved. The suboptimal, which is instant gratification but produces consciousness through pain. And then to do nothing and do nothing also can be used when you need more information. So if you, if you have a choice to make but you need more information, doing nothing is a wise thing because then you gather the information to make an intelligent choice. Once you know what your dream is, you know where you're out of balance and you know what choices you need to make, then you must establish your own dream affirmative values for each of those four doctors. I am happy when I. Therefore, you've got to be clear. I am happy when I am 
playing with my kids. I am happy when I'm loving my wife. I am happy when I'm building my new race car. I am happy when I'm lifting weights in the gym. So you know what it is that you must do for yourself to create happiness. Most people sit around waiting for happiness to jump on their back and make their world better like they wait to win the lottery. Then you have to get clear about what your movement needs are to achieve your dream and to achieve baseline health, and you have to set values for that. I need to move my body 30 minutes a day. My preferred way to do it is walking or playing with my dog or going to the gym or riding my bicycle or using a rowing machine. But there has to be a value that they're willing to apply as a, a, a daily part of their life so they need to go through and establish dream affirmative values for what makes me happy, how much movement do I need, how much quiet time and rest do I need, and introspection time to have a relationship with myself. We have a culture that has no relationship with itself at all. It doesn't even know who it is. They only identify themselves by the clothes they wear, the clubs they hang out in, the sports they do or the jobs they do, but on the inside they haven't got a clue who they are. So their only sense of self is what they can accomplish or how good they can look, which is, a, you know, Buddha warned us of that trap a long time ago. And so does many others. So you've got quiet diet, movement, and happiness. You have to have a clear understanding of what types of foods, what quality of food, and what types of foods your body needs so you can develop that relationship. And when you have those four steps in place, 90% of people – go into a, a complete flowering. It's as though the sun comes out, they open up, they clean their bodies out, their energy comes back, their vitality comes back, and as the body gets healthier, a person naturally becomes more creative and naturally makes better decisions. And there are a truckload of people out there, uh, you know, a world load of people out there that will be challenged facing these simple questions, and that's why check HLC practitioners and the more current Czech practitioners are in the world. That's what I'm trying to do is give people a legitimate group of professionals who eats, sleeps, breathes, and shits the philosophy so that they are not talking about stuff they have no legitimate experience of, and they are living examples to guide other people and take them by the hand and say, don't worry about all the books and all the articles. Let me show you how to do this. And instead of arguing with people, Many times people have sat in my office paying me 500 bucks an hour and all they want to do is defend why they should keep eating gluten and tell me about all the articles that say it's bullshit and all this stuff. And I simply take off my clothes and say, look, this is what your teacher looks like. You get undressed and look in the mirror and tell me if that is working for you because you don't need my help to keep listening to the same experts that got you sick. And I said, Every time you read an article that says stuff that goes against my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, you go on Google Images and type in the name of that author, and you tell me what you see. And everyone that's ever done that comes back to me and says, oh, my God, these are all fat, sick people writing all these books about health. Lo and behold. So don't go to sick doctors for health advice. Don't go to broken therapists for health advice. My mission is to create legitimate people who have committed themselves to the mastery of the life process so they can be honest, authentic guides for other people. And that does not include silliness, corporate crap, selling garbage, Red Bull, Gatorade, and all that shit. And that's another problem. People do all sorts of stuff for money that they know is unethical, but they do it anyhow. And, uh, you know, that's really what I'm trying to do. And so my answer to your question is, if you can't get it on your own, then you've got to hire a guide. And that's what the hero's journey is all about. Once you realize you don't want to be that same person tomorrow that you are today, you enter into the hero's journey. And one of the things you need on a hero's journey to make it through the challenges is a mentor. And Czech holistic lifestyle coaches and Czech practitioners are my attempt to add mentors to the world because we don't have them. The medical profession is full of people that are sicker or as sick as the very people they're doing therapy on so people become robots, not human beings. It's something we talk about a lot on the podcast, that if you don't have a solution to your problem and you've been going around for months and years rattling around the same stuff, then you need to invest in yourself and the longevity of your health and you need to, you need to get a coach. You need to pay for someone. It's, it's fundamental. 
Um, Paul, I, I realise we've only got about five minutes left of this interview um, and I really value your time. Um, last quick question. Um, How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy is an incredible book. You've never written or revised a copy as far as I'm aware. If you were to go back, w would you change anything? Yes, um, it has been revised a bit. You know, it's in its like its sixth printing. We've sold over 120,000 copies now. Um, I started revising it, but unfortunately, the things that I wanted to put in there made it bigger and more things to think about. For example, I put I, I, in my newest version, I wrote infant development exercises in because they're so fundamental to restore normal body mind integration and so foundational for almost anybody out there. But again, it's another element that requires a lot of brain power. So I wanted to add the infant development, but when I looked at how much more mental work it was to juggle all the stuff that's in Eat, Move, and Be Healthy already, and I look at the average person's capacity to make change, I realized as though it would technically make the book a lot more complete, it would probably get less uh, participation because people are already so exhausted and overwhelmed. So the last four doctors will ever need was something that I wrote to sort of take the simpler concepts and get that structure of what do I love, what do I need to balance, what choices am I willing to make, and what values do I need to make to support my dream. So you know, now I've been looking at the possibility of rewriting How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy as a kid's book and bringing it down to the simplistic level of the kids but also writing it in such a way that any adult or parent that followed the same advice I'm giving the kids would get the same basic responses as Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, but with a lot less technical lingo, more pictures, and more fun. Because after doing this for 31 years now, I'm able to synthesize it down to the most essential key points, where before I was too insecure that if I made it that simple that it would have any impact. But now I realize where I tried to be complete and well-balanced in my approach, it was too intellectually demanding for people. So now what I've got to do is take a step back and make it simple enough that even a 12-year-old can do it and know that if they can do that, then the current Eat, Move, and Be Healthy would be effective for them as the next step. Well, um, I for one hope you redo that because I, um, I think your book's fantastic as it is but um, I always like to read a lot of uh, your work I think it's fascinating um, Paul uh, you said you'd give me an hour that's an hour um, so I know that we need to wrap up the show I can't thank you enough for sharing your thoughts today on the show I know people are going to be uh, hugely appreciative of that um, Paul for anyone that wants to find a bit more about you your education system where would you like to send them well uh since you're in England, you know, you have, we have checkeurope.com, C-H-E-K Europe.com, and we have uh, our, our exercise coach is coming up on um, 11th of March to the 15th of March, which is an entry-level program that anybody can get into. We have the golf biomechanics or golf performance specialist and the uh, tennis conditioning coming all in March. So if anyone goes to the checkeurope.com, they can look there, or they can just go to checkinstitute.com, and, you know, there's a pile of stuff there. If they want, they can watch my blog, paulchecksblog.com, C-H-E-K-S, with no apostrophe, a web address, uh, paulchecksblog.com, and um, we have checkconnect.com, which is another resource, and ppssuccess.com, which is my mental, emotional, and spiritual healing program with 12 lessons that anybody can buy and do right on the Internet. Um, so, again, check Europe.com for people over in Europe and England. Check Institute.com for the general studies and schedules and audios and books and courses. PPS Success for personal, professional, spiritual growth training. And... C-H-E-K, connect for those that want to look at some of our other integrated stuff and to be able to find a, a Czech practitioner near you. There's a worldwide search function, so you can find out on checkconnect.com uh, who is the nearest to you and what is their skill level of training and all that. Right, everyone. Uh, Paul, thank you. That's incredible. Uh, you know the book, How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy. You know the courses. Uh, please do go check out Paul's work if you're a trainer. If you're an individual... 
um, that's looking to improve their health, then take this uh, information on board. It's, it's, it's gold dust, and we, we've talked many times on the podcast about how the mental side of all of this health and fitness component is, is probably the biggest factor. You know, It's easy to work out calories, macronutrients, eat real food, move. Um, a lot of it's uh, unlocked upstairs. Um, if you enjoyed the show, please do me the massive honour of sharing it on Facebook, Twitter, interact with me and Paul when it gets posted online, um, share your thoughts um, as you normally do on Twitter and stuff. You know, we need to know. And if you want this information to get out to more people, you guys have to share this stuff. Um, I'll be back on the show next week with Rachel for a Q&A episode. Uh, so, Paul, thank you very much again for joining me on the show. Hey, thank you, Ben. You're doing a great job. Lovely to see you sharing such valuable information with people that desperately need to hear some truth from someone who's a truth seeker. So keep up the great work, work there, partner. Thank you. Uh, it means a lot coming from someone that influenced uh, my career completely. Um, right, we're done. Uh, it's bye from Paul and bye from me, and I will see you guys soon. Ciao. Hey, everyone, Ben Cooper Radio. I have taken an awful long time to get going this morning. I've just flown in from Mexico. Um, the night we flew in from Mexico, I had two hours sleep, and I was an absolute walking zombie. 